So welcome everybody today. My name is Alicia Wise and I'm from the Clocks Archive and I'm co-chairing today with Kirsty Lingstadt from the University of York. And we have a terrific panel organized by Jenny Mitchum at the TPC. We have some fun facts about our panelists to get us started. So Jenny, can you wave? Hi. Training for an ultra marathon. Come give her sympathy or cakes. Yes. And the talent just extends from there. James, I thought this was in many ways the most intriguing fun fact. He is from the University of Southampton where he has returned after 20 years. He used to be a student there. So if you need advice about where to go clubbing, I think that's probably your source. We have Sonia Renaday from the National Archives. And um, I'm an archeologist, so I particularly love this one. Sonia is a potter, she knows how to throw pottery. So uh, do you have any pictures of your work on your phone? Uh, <laughs> nothing of the quality that I could share, honestly. Ah. <laughs> Early days. And last but not least, we have Leontin Taubon. 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 Yeah. I'm still not saying it right. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> From the Cambridge University Library, though those are not the affiliations I think you'll find in the app. Um, who has made her jumper? And if you come up close yeah. to chat with her, ask her a question. Because there's a dinosaur and some cactuses. It's yeah. really incredible. <laughs> it's the dinosaur from like the Google Chrome, you know, when it yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So um, without further ado, we have a terrific panel for you. Um, and enjoy. Over to you. Thank you. Shall I start the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Leontine. Um, and today we are going to be talking about the computational access guide, um, which is a part of work that I did um, in collaboration with the DPC um, and was funded by the SSI um, Software Sustainability Institute, as I'm one of their fellows. Um, so basically, what we're doing today is, is giving a really brief overview of the guide because we've got limited time and then we're going to discuss some topics that are touched upon within the guide but not really gone into a lot of depth within a panel session so yeah um, so <laughs> to start out with what is computational access um, so when we started setting up this guide we had a bunch of workshops with people and um, a lot of like emails back and forth around like what what we wanted to define computational access as um, and what it basically comes down to is that it's any type of access that requires computational methods. So you can think of the cool state-of-the-art stuff as AI and ML and all that needing computation, like needing data sets and stuff. But it's just as simple as someone having a spreadsheet and wanting to summarize a whole bunch of stuff. Like you need the same type of access to be able to uh, accommodate for both of them. Um, what we also thought was really in, important was that it should be available in the digital environment and scalable to a certain extent. So by the digital environment, I mainly mean the online public space, but for some institutions, there's some restrictions around access and that may not be an option, um, but it will still be digitally available um, in, that, in that sense and scalable, um, which is important because I don't know how many of you have done this as part of your job, but um, just handing people hard drives with data on it <laughs> is not is not what we would consider computational access. Um, and then another important point to say is that if granted by copyright laws or other regulations, it should be accessible to all. Um, but that's of course not always the case. Um, I'm really, really going to go briefly over these because we don't have a lot of time. But um, there's we define four different approaches. Um, they're not in like, or it's not as if one's better than the other, it depends on your institution and some institutions may pick to have two of them in place. So you could have like bulk data sets and you could have an API available to people. Um, the one that's a bit different in this list is the terms of use. Um, basically that's, anyone could set that up and that basically gives people who would want to like scrape your data for example or use your data sets an idea of like what types of terms are around that material. Um, so <laughs> why is this actually relevant to our community? Um, there's, a few, there's a few reasons. So um, it opens up the material to new audiences because it makes it um, 
computationally available. I'm referring here to the work of Tom Padilla, who, sorry Tom, is also <laughs> in the room. <laughs> Yay! Yay. Um, so, um, and, um, so, so like, there's, there's new possibilities with it. Um, and as a lot of you may know, is that um, they copy a lot of like the ideas of analog material into like a dig or like um, I have to say this slightly differently. Um, the the ideas around analog material are copied into like doing similar processes around digital material, and that doesn't always work out very well. Um, but it can also really empower our practice in the sense that um, we can join in like conversations around this type of material because um, if we have a basic understanding of what it means for us, we can go out and talk to technical people and also raise like important concerns that we have around ethics but also around um, documentation, um, which is not always a priority within the data science community, but for us like it's, it's one of the main things. Um, so, I think that's it. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Leontine. So, I was just going to say a little bit more about the guide to computational access that Leontine mentioned. So, the guide was created by, largely by Leontine, but with a lot of help as well, um, from the DPC and from the panel of experts depicted here. So, this photo was taken at an expert workshop that we hosted in February this year, an online workshop um, where we provided cookies um, as a way of trying to absorb as much information as possible out of the experts. Um, it, it worked quite well, actually. I think the cookies did their job and uh, we got loads of information. So, we made lots of use of um, online tools like Jamboard, such as the one depicted here. Uh, and Google Drive to brainstorm and gather information during the workshop. And these points, so for example, all those points on that Jamboard there were expanded and rationalised into text for the guide itself, which again was a collaborative exercise. And this slide shows what the guide we created actually looks like, and um, that's its cover, and also here are its main sections. So um, a, quite a large section is the definitions section. As Leontine mentioned, there's a whole load of definitions and associated terms around computational access that um, not everyone knows the answer to or knows, knows what they mean. So if you're struggling during this session, just dive into the guide, into the definitions uh, section, and hopefully it'll all become clear. Um, so I have put a link to this guide in the collaborative notes for today if you want to access it quickly. Otherwise, uh, just Google for it or find it on the DPC website. So we've also got a, a piece on approaches to computational <coughs> access that Leontine already touched on uh, that describes those four different approaches. We've got a very short section on the ethics of computational access, um, but this was something that um, we felt we couldn't go into in a lot of detail in the guide itself, so that was a topic that we really wanted to pull out and discuss further today, so um, we will be doing that. And I also like the practical steps section, so um, this gives some ideas about actions that anyone could take to start to move forward with computational access in their own organisation. Um, so it's really practical and, and helpful and hopefully most people looking at that can take one thing and, and go away and start, uh, start doing it. So this guide is now freely available to all. Do have a look. Um, as I said, it can be found on the DPC website. Um, a, a very quick word on the scope of the guide. So firstly, it's aimed at digital preservation practitioners, not users of digital collections. And also, it's aimed at beginners. So um, for that reason, I guess the guide won't tell you everything about computational access, but it should tell you enough to enable you to um, just get started with the topic, uh, to understand whether it's something that is relevant and useful to you, and to, to find some first steps for moving forward. That's really what we were aiming for with this. But one of the challenges of writing a guide um, such as this um, which is actually quite short and concise, is the fact there's so much interesting stuff that you have to leave out. And that's why we wanted to arrange this panel session today, just to give us a chance to cover a little bit more ground and go into some of these topics um, in a little bit more detail um, with our panellists. So those are the, the four main topics we're going to be covering today. So now seems like a good point to introduce uh, the members of this panel. Um, so it's great to be joined by James and Sonia and, of course, Leontine. 
Uh, and I'm just going to start by asking them all to introduce themselves. So I think we'll start with James, because you're first on the list. But if you could just say your name, your role. Um, well, maybe you don't need to say your name, since it's there already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps just tell us, most importantly, um, what your experience is with computational access, so what angle you're coming at this from. I guess I'm coming computational access from both a kind of user and consumer of services that make stuff. Um, as a publisher of a journal that tries to use those data and those services, um, and also as a sort of sometime person who was in, involved in kind of making those services available as well in a previous, previous well, not much of a previous life, but in 10 years ago now. So, yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks, James. And Sonia, you're next. Yep, so um, my angle on this is obviously as an archive, we take in digital records, which are more or less amenable to computational access when they come into the archive. Um, and we have the challenge of needing to do something practical to provide access to those records, and increasingly that means computational access. So I'm Nayantine, and as you know, I've helped uh, create this guide. Um, so uh, just to mention here as well, I did this work as part of my PhD uh, research. So I did a collaborative PhD with the National Archives here in the UK and uh, University College London. Um, but if you want to find me now, I'm at Cambridge, so if you want to contact me. So yeah. <laughs> Great, so thanks to all three of you for coming today. And we had to have a slight change around of panellists um, uh, since we, we planned this, so it's really good to have you all here. Um, and I should say as well, so I'm Jenny Mitchum, um, I work at the DPC and I confess that I knew very, very little about this topic um, before starting work on supporting the creation of this guide with um, Leontine. So I've learned an awful lot in the last six months, but I'm going to limit myself to asking the questions and not answering any, if that's okay. I'm going to leave this to the experts. So let's dive into our first topic, which is um, around resources and infrastructure. So, I was wondering if uh, the panellists had any advice on getting started with computational access, um, particularly for organisations with limited resources. So, how do they actually begin to make the case and get started? And I'm going to throw that question first to James, if that's okay. Um, yeah, okay. So, I mean, I'm obviously not an organisation that's getting started. I'm coming at it from slightly different angles. But I guess what I've observed over the years is the kind of beware of the platform and beware the kind of the idea of a platform as a panacea um, and the fact that you do often find the kind of creep I guess um, of a desire to kind of meet various people's needs expand different types of access and before you know it you've kind of created a potential theoretical beast that can't be made <laughs> and so starting practically and that's one of the reasons I think the guide's really lovely the guide does go right from your kind of your sort of full-blown API access right down to how you might make a data set available. And that kind of combination of those two layers and finding that middle ground that works for your organisation and works for users ultimately as well is going to be really valuable. So I don't know if Sonia had anything to add on that one. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, we have to start somewhere um, and we have to start small. So we, you know, we have a grand vision for what we might be able to accomplish um, and what opportunities this might create. Um, but the important thing is to start. And I know that as memory institutions, we worry about inconsistent access. Um, we were hearing in the keynote just now about how the choices that we make can bias the use of the collection. Um, you know, we've seen that it's that material that's available that is used and that fuels further use. Um, there's a kind of paralysis there, I think. It's better to start and to do something and to build on it. Um, and then the other thing to note is that in putting something out there, it doesn't stand alone. It's there in the context of the other collections that other people have made available, other institutions, even if they're all very small. Um, and so there's something there to build on and also um, something there for us to share and to learn from each other in having started to tackle that challenge. Leontine, did you have anything? Yeah, just like continuing on from what Jane said, like it, it really, you don't have to necessarily set up the most sophisticated, sorry, <laughs> the sophisticated platform in one go, like just making a data set available could, could be enough, like it's a start and that's, that's the most important thing. Great, thanks everyone. So I think one of the key messages there is really just doing something, start by doing something and I know 
the computational access guide is designed to, to help you just start to do something. And the first of those approaches to computational access that's mentioned is just terms of use, and it's really just putting a data set out there with some terms of use that people can do computational stuff over, and that's like quite a, a well, I, I wouldn't say easy, but it's one of the easiest ways of getting started. Yeah, and also just like being aware of the fact that if you as an institution are making stuff available, and maybe not in a computational access way, it's, it still could be the case that people consider scraping your material and therefore it, it's great to have some type of terms of use out there to make them aware of like any copyright restrictions or any, any other stuff that could, could potentially be of importance. Great, thank you. So um, we should move on to our next topic, which is about communicating with stakeholders. And by this, we're, we're not thinking about users as stakeholders in this, um, in this topic. We're thinking about all the people that can help us do computational access, so the people that are going to give us the money to do it and the people that are going to help with the IT support and, and anything else. So um, the first question is, so communication seems to be key to making progress in pretty much any area of digital preservation. Um, but I think this is particularly so with an emerging topic such as this one, which involves so much collaboration with different people across an organisation. So how do we effectively build relationships with key stakeholders? So I'm thinking, like, as I said, particularly the people that can help you with that work. And let's go to Leontine first, if that's okay. All right, like the communication. Yeah, it's like, it's really, really difficult because, and that's one of the reasons as well was in the guide that we decided to put in some definitions and stuff because within, the, within our um, uh, community, there's a lot of terms used, but they're sometimes used incorrectly, you know, like not on purpose, but like incorrectly, or um, people don't really know what they, what they entail. Um, and therefore, we, we thought it was important to put that part of the definitions in as well so that you can start that communication with like, stakeholders. Um, so yeah. Can I follow up on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's really helpful to have examples as well. I mean, I'm geeky enough to think APIs are really exciting. Yeah, they are. Um, but that's <laughs> quite hard to explain to someone. You know, what does it look like? How do I use it? What is it? Um, so to be able to showcase a little bit what's possible when you make collections available in this way for reuse, I think is really important to be able to point at even quite small projects and mm -hmm. say, um, you know, types of questions that weren't possible to be asked before can be facilitated um, in this way. It's just something tangible um, that you can direct people to uh, that can help make the case in the way that saying, look at my API, really, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it's, it's difficult. Um, we're, we're making the case to people who aren't necessarily directly engaged um, in using these collections in this way. Yeah, and it's like a lot of like, there's a lot of effort that has to go into it before you get like, um, like yeah. a, um, what is it, um, a result out of it. Yeah, so it's... It's a lot of work to get it's there. It's a lot of work, it? yeah. yeah. But it's if like someone's instant. got there and if you can start can to share those to examples, yeah. I think that's got to help. Great, thank you. So um, I've got another question, which I think I'll throw at James, if that's okay. So... Um, it's about how we sustain computational access services and keep them running, so particularly if they're funded as exploratory projects, which I think they often are, rather than sort of considered to be essential services. Yeah, and this is quite an interesting one for me because um, I'm slightly going to put Leonti on the spot as well because <laughs> <laughs> you've been working on this recently and sort of interviewing members of the community and asking them about sort of the pinch points around providing long-term availability of computational access and the pinch point appears to be projects yep. and we've used the word project quite a lot already and projects are kind of a problem in this sense um, because they... They, they have a beginning and at the end they have finite resourcing, all that kind of stuff. And projects can get things going, but there is a problem of them not being the infrastructures that you necessarily need. And I think one of the things we, we had a little kind of like cheap version of this beforehand last week when we were having a chat <laughs> <laughs> um, about these questions. And one thing that came up there was about like trying to make the argument for which things should be a project and which shouldn't. Yes. So like the infrastructure perhaps shouldn't be a project. but the work to find out the things you guys were just talking about, about who are our users, what are our communities, what are the examples, should be a project. Because you don't want your infrastructure to be kind of 
tracking people constantly because that's kind of a bit grim. What you want ultimately is the project team to better assemble the examples that show the value of the work to enable the infrastructure to per perpetuate. Yeah. And that feels like out of the work you were doing at least and interviewing the community were, were the real pinch points in the community. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's it's such a difficult uh, thing to have because you have to really find strike a balance between it because the, the newer stuff and the and the more engaging stuff it's difficult to make a case for it so you're happy when it's funded as a project but now because technology like this digital access cannot be longer seen as something separate from the infrastructure it just becomes very very difficult because how do you sustain that infrastructure if it's project project based so yeah can I be slightly controversial? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, I think projects create lots of different and lovely resources. Yes. Don't they? they create websites, they create user interfaces, they create data. Uh, I think maybe not all of it needs to be sustained in the same way for the long oh, yeah, term. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> no, I agree, I agree. Um, you know, so you know, web resources, maybe they can <coughs> be crawled into a web archive and perhaps we think that's good enough in the long term. Um, so for me, again, back to your point about infrastructure, it's about the data yep. um, and allowing that to live on, but maybe um, as part of a different service, possibly. Yep. Yeah, thanks for throwing that in. It's important, <laughs> it's important to, to mention that not everything needs to be sustained. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next topic. So this is where we're talking about um, the stakeholders that are actually our audience and our users. Um, so given that there's little benefit in facilitating computational access to our collections if no one uses them, I was just wondering to what extent your work is informed by the needs of your users. Um, and are they actively asking for this kind of thing, or are you just really second guessing what, what they might require? So that's going to Sonia, I think. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, so in common with um, most of UK government now, uh, we are very keen that our services um, and service development is informed by user need. Um, so interviewing users, doing user research has become a really core part of the way we develop digital services. We always like to talk to them, but it's become a much more proactive thing. Um, and when it comes to computational access, it's hard to find people to talk to. Um, if you walk into, you know, traditionally we could find users by walking into our reading room. Well, they're not always the right people to tell us about how to develop these types of services. Um, we get really good engagement from um, digital historians, digital humanities profession professionals, um, a little bit from the legal profession. But it's really hard to get that, those kind of diverse voices into our user research on this subject. We would like to do more. Um, we would like to talk to more people. We're kind of a little bit in this build it and they will come mentality and that's not at all the approach that we want we want it to be like firmly grounded in what our users have told us they want to use so it's a struggle for us I was going to say, yeah. with my kind of publisher hat on, so some of you know I, I, I'm one of the people who publishes the Programme Historian and works on that, that group. I think the, the Build It and They Will Come model really scares us as a publisher. Yeah. So people, so we, we publish open access, peer-reviewed, multilingual tutorials in the humanities. And one of our criteria for our reviewers is around sustainability, so, and not environmental sustainability at the moment. But it's like, will this, will this lesson, if we publish it and put our effort into it as a community, will it last for a good few years without having to make radical changes to it and sometimes people come to us with proposals for articles and they're based on services and we just kind of go oh, I'm not sure we want to publish that because I'm, I'm not sure that thing is going to be around I'm not sure they've really demonstrated a community around that service that makes us feel confident as a publisher that we should put that material out there and there is at least one very large institution which I shan't name whose service we did trust and whose service did go down and killed a, at least one article that we had on the site that we had to eventually remove. And with that hat on, it's like the, it, the engage in the audience thing is thinking about us as well. So it's like, have you engaged enough of an audience as someone like a publisher like ours feels that we can feel confident that service is going to be around long enough for us to kind of put our effort into creating um, some materials around it? Yeah. And also from like a user needs perspective, it's, it's very interesting because like, with what Sonia was saying as well, like you don't always like it's difficult to find the people who are doing this type of research. But then you also have um, if you show them examples of what is possible, people will say, "Oh, I want that." But then 
not necessarily um, want to engage with more of the process that goes into to doing that. So what I mean by that, like sometimes it's like a, like a black box where something goes in and something comes out and like researchers may be happy with that. But then it also raises that question of like, Mm, are, are we necessarily happy with that, them not really knowing what is going on or what has happened to the data? Because like, those processes that we set up as institutions could be biased in certain ways around uh, what is possible. So, yeah, I think I touched upon one of our topics for later on as well. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Okay. So, so just if anyone in sure. the room has had any success with getting good user engagement on needs for computational access, I would love to hear about that. Yes, yes Me too, yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's the sort of thing that we, it would be great to um, produce some kind of published report on. If someone's got a case study they can share, or even if it's just a blog post, um, it'd be good to have that out there. And um, I mean, we'd be happy to publish something like that as a DPC as well. So yes, do do get in touch with us. Um, so just to turn that question around slightly, um, how easy do you think it is for users to influence the access options that are available, and how can they make themselves heard? Uh, this one's for James. We, this one. Do we need to use? We need this? to pass the mic. Ah, right. Sorry. Fun. Could you repeat the question? I was <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sure thing, James. So I was going to turn that question around slightly and ask how easy it is for the users to influence the access options that are available, and how can they make themselves heard? Ooh, um, I think one of my answers to this question is always like, and I think hopefully most people in this room feel this anyway, is like kind of beware of users a bit. So like one of my many hats is as a historian by training and my, my colleagues do have a slight habit of saying, oh, we should keep everything, or we should make everything available, or we should digitize everything. And those users aren't, I'm not saying those users are not useful, but those kinds of sort of viewpoints don't necessarily further what we're trying to achieve in these areas. And I guess it's around asking the right kinds of questions of users. Um, and ensuring that the users don't and aren't able to fall into that space that's kind of providing the sort of like, you know, I want access to everything in exactly the way I need to as a computational access route. And it goes back to the point earlier about um, thinking about the panaceas of platforms in a way. Um, those platforms can, those platforms that don't seem to succeed quite as well seem to be because maybe some of their user stories are taking them in too many directions. Actually focusing the user stories and thinking about who particular types of learners might be or particular types of users might be. Um, I, I really like sort of learner stories, user stories, stuff like that. And then focusing in on the ones that I think, well, we can deliver in this area, even if at the moment those people have to be kind of not left out, but less, less attended to. Yeah, that's really good. Can I? Um, so I, as I've said, I'd like to hear a little bit more from users. Um, but you're right, like, they're really diverse in their needs, their views. Um, one of the challenges for us around computational access has always been how much should we facilitate? Um, so to what extent should we say, here's the material, here are the records, do what you will? Um, and to what extent should we try and make that easier for them, provide platforms, provide tools? In doing that, what about our own biases that we introduce? Um, this is a really difficult challenge. I think. Um, we have to walk a line. We can't do nothing because we want the material to be used and we've got to recognise that um, lots of people don't have either the skills or the technology and infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, equally, we can't do everything for everyone. So, thanks, Sonia. I should move on to the next topic, which I think you just sort of touched on a bit there, Sonia, which is ethics. Um, so this is a huge topic, as I'm sure you know, so I've left a whole six minutes for this <laughs> to cover the ethics of computational access. So I know um, Abigail and, and Megan will be touching on this, this topic in their talk after, so you'll get to hear a little bit, bit more on this. Um, but I wanted to ask the panellists whether a consideration of the ethics of computational access or the inherent bias of the tools and techniques have impacted their own work in this area. And who was I throwing this at? Leontine. Oh, no. <laughs> you have such six a, minutes. <laughs> it's, I've got six minutes. Um, it's such a huge topic, isn't it? And like what well, I touched upon a minute ago, where it's like um, the processes that we use could be seen as something like a bias as well to, towards that material. Um, but also just like 
um, was related to Essex is that like influence from from other like larger companies or big tech so like the keyword search that I'm not a huge fan of um, but like the, there's there's just so many like that's that's a really good example of oh it's really easy to use and like users you know are for, for, are familiar with it but it's not necessarily to wait the way to like open up computational access if that makes sense like for example um, sorry the UK government web archive is bloody great but if you type in for example prime minister you get 10 million results like okay cool um, it's not like <laughs> <laughs> and then like it's not like in any way like um, ordered because that would bring in a bias but then like how do you how do you find the material that you're specifically looking for and that really shows off that like kind of like that's not that's not how we should be doing digital access, but how should we be doing it and how should we be facilitating, like you were saying, users in, in the sense that we're not bringing our own bias into it as well. So, yeah, I, I don't really have an answer there. <laughs> <laughs> so just to, to ask a, a sub-question on that, um, I was going to ask, have you found considerations of the ethics of computational access to be a barrier to making progress with or embracing computational access techniques? And I was going to direct that to Sonia. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about risk. Um, so computation access is amazing. Um, we talk a lot about the opportunities, about the fantastic things that would be possible if we could do this more. Um, you know, ways of really opening up access to collections, ways to enable researchers to ask very different types of questions. Um, but it comes with a risk for us. So they could equally use that computational access to reveal things that should not have been in the public domain. Um, there are privacy issues. Um, and it, so it, it start, all that opportunity also starts to look quite risky. Um, and we're doing a piece of work at the moment um, to try and reintroduce friction, which seems a strange thing to do. So with paper archives... Researchers are just inherently limited um, in the way that they can work with them. So you have to come to the archive. You can only order so many documents. You can only physically read so many documents. Um, and so we're thinking about how do we reintroduce some of that natural friction that there previously was in the archive into the digital um, because otherwise we're faced with a world where maybe the risks will be, stuff, uh, will be such that the material has to remain closed for so much longer, um, where we perhaps can't provide access in the way that we would want to, or where fewer records come into the public domain, or they come into the public domain much later. Um, so we're kind of grappling with this. What can we do to, again, steer that course between opening up access as far as we can, but managing the risk that comes um, with all of this potential? Um, so I guess that's kind of an ethical issue. Yeah, and I'm just to add to that, I, I'm, I say I'm all for friction in these things. Um, I have to admit. So, I mean, some of you know I've done work over the years on things like sort of histories of catalogue data and stuff like that. And thinking about the multivocality, for example, of the data that underpins a lot of the records that are made available through computational access. And, you know, that just underscores to me that we need to introduce a bit of friction in that process to, to prompt users to go, did you know this record was written 90 years ago? Like, does that matter in how you're then going to computationally analyse these collections at scale, given that some of the underlying metadata and its structures or its vocabularies are from a different time, a different place? And I guess one of the things that sort of overlaps with is that kind of the way in which institutions, whether conscious or otherwise, do end up having a kind of singular institutional voice. And some of the histories of professions about the role of the individual and their sort of prominence or otherwise within their collections. And those things kind of, for me, like inserting the people who do stuff back into the data that we're, we're publishing where, where appropriate really helps introduce perhaps some of that friction that we might want. I think, oh, sorry. And I think that's actually a really important uh, thing that we can contribute to this as well, like that documentation around digital material. Because um, like, well, once it's at scale, it, it very much highlights some of the like documentational issues around it. So um, an example that I keep using is uh, digitization. So it's great that we're digitizing parts of our collections. But a big problem of it is that we don't ourselves document 
why certain collections are digitized or why certain parts are, are you know are not digitized and I think if we had some type of documentation around that, especially if you're using these materials in bulk, it would like it would just greatly benefit users because they will understand that data set in, in more of a meaningful way. So yeah. That was six minutes. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> right. So just to end, we wanted to end on a positive note, and I think this was James's idea because he thought I think when we were, we were doing our little rehearsal, we got into the depths of. Um, ethics and it all started to get a bit deep and we decided we should end, end on a high. So I was just going to ask the panellists if they have a good example of what computational access looks like when it's done really well. Um, have you got a favourite example you can share that you would encourage people to go away and have a look at? So should we go with, well, Leontine, you've got the mic, so. <laughs> um, so my favourite example and how this work actually started partly is um, the Glam Workbench. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with it. If you're not, go and have a look at it. Um, but it highlights how if you make any type of your material available as an institution, what people can do with it. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just really cool. Um, and also showcases how with limited resources what is possible, uh, which is also really important. Is it my go? Um, so I'm going to cheat. I don't have an example. <laughs> um, but one of the things I've loved seeing is um, how much we've started to qualify the data that we put out there. So not just the, the catalogue data or the original record, but that data around where did it come from and who said this about it and who made this assertion and when and using what tools and when we processed it, what did we use? So I just... I love the idea that we can make that much richer um, knowledge that we have about the collections available and available in itself for computational access. And, and mine is the Wikidata Query Service. Um, I, as a historian with my historian hat on, I do have qualms about the ways in which Wikidata kind of um, represents temporality and change in concepts. However, um, the query service is documented by default through how the data is documented through version control. Um, I absolutely hate Sparkle. I've been battling with it for about 12 years <laughs> of my life. However, Sparkle and that kind of like um, technology um, as, a, as a querying language is stable and robust and works really well and has great guides around it. Um, there are loads of resources around the query endpoint. There's a great community. There are people based on a Telegram group. I occasionally just ping and go, why isn't this working? And they kind of tell me what I'm doing wrong with Sparkle. And it has an underlying technology with Wikibase um, and a wonderful community that supports that technology as well, which means you can go and make your own equivalent ontologies that use the same, ultimately, infrastructure, same query service, et cetera, et cetera. So that interactivity is, is, is really wonderful. and It's been lovely to see that develop over the last few years. Great. Uh, thanks to all of you. So I should say as well that in the computational access guide, we've, we've filled it with uh, examples, links out to resources you can go and look at. And we've also got a load of um, case studies that we recorded in a, um, the launch event for that computational access guide. So you could go and have a look at those as well if you want to see some really nice examples. So those were the questions I had on my list. Um, so I think it's time to open up to audience questions, if anyone has any. April. Do I need a microphone? Yes, I, think. Like, yes, I do. <laughs> for, for, for access. Yes, yeah. for access, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I dropped my phone. <laughs> That's all good. Um, Sonia and James. Friction. <laughs> really? So what do you mean by friction? Do you mean a deliberate obstacle in gaining access to the material? Do you have examples of friction? Oh, um, I'm tempted to let you go first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, 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 deliberate obstacle sounds horrible, doesn't it? It doesn't sound at all like what we're trying to do. But if the alternative were no access, would we accept some additional friction in order to be, to be able to make the material available at all? Um, and that's where we are, I think, that looking at some of the risks... Um, the potential is that we would say, well, we can't provide access to this material because people could ask all kinds of questions and potentially reveal information that shouldn't be out there at all. So how much friction can we accept? Can we accept any? And in terms of examples, it could be, for example, um, that that data is made available 
um, in such a way that researchers can come in and work with it but not take it away, for example. It could be the other extreme. It could be, well, no, come to the reading room and sit there and look at it. I mean, that's not really perhaps what we want. So I don't think we've quite worked out how to do it, only that um, potentially putting everything out there completely openly um, is unlikely to be possible for us. Um, and yet closing things speculatively just in case is also really difficult. And we don't want to do that. Okay. Um, I, guess, I guess the first thought that comes to mind is Temi Odomosu's work and the work on the digitization of the Danish colonial archives and essentially a, a wonderful piece that kind of points out what happens when there aren't frictions, when, when through a process of digitization and then public, making material publicly available, you end up with a picture of a, a crying child, effectively, um, publicly available and accessible and reproducible and that can then be taken wildly outside of its context. Um, I've worked with sort of small museums a lot over the last few years. One of the things they're really keen to underscore is like that the museum is a, even, has, even though there are many problems with the authority those museums have over some of their collections, they're a space where things can't be radically decontextualized. And I guess that's one of my kind of thinking points around this. You know, I go back to my Wikidata query service. You know, it would be really a useful reminder for me querying large amounts of data to have a confrontation with the way in which an individual property had been described over time and how it had evolved over time and how the community had come to a fudged agreement about, say, for example, their quite terrible um, property around sex and gender, for example. Um, and sometimes I might forget some of those sort of conversations and disputes, and sometimes I might need a kind of clarifying reminder not to use some of those properties in ways that might stray beyond their intentions or stray beyond some of the, the caveats the community have put around how they should and shouldn't be used. And I think it's those kind of spaces for me where how can we, you know, append metadata in such ways that means it, obviously it can't not, never be stripped, but how can we make sure that is kind of front and centre with how things are presented to people? But sometimes it can be just really, really obvious. I mean, um, making sure that when someone presses download on a data set that is sort of their subset of a collection, that it comes with some metadata about when they downloaded that and what their search terms were. So they, again, have a bit of friction in their process. Maybe that's the file name, I don't know. But it feels to me we just need to be confronted a little bit more with things around what we're doing because when we, when we go into going back to your example of going into the reading room, we remember those days. We remember where we were, remember what we didn't do, remember kind of like who we had coffee with at lunch and how that steered our conversation in the afternoon. And, and those kind of tangible material interactions are more embedded in the research process and the memory of that work. And it might, and I know I'm thinking about research here, but that might not quite be the same with someone sort of writing some code, downloading some data, and then getting on with what they do next. They might need those interruptions in that data. Great answer. Um, so, any more questions from the room? Oh, loads. Um, you, you choose. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Roxana Maurer from the National Library of Luxembourg. I have a question regarding our colleagues from the same institution. So I'm responsible for digital preservation. So basically a lot about born digital uh, material. And the problem I have is that we provide really a lot of computational access in different forms for our digitized content. We even have a website with uh, data sets, uh, working on APIs and things like this. But every time I try to convince my colleagues we need to do something also for our born digital <laughs> collection, <laughs> is I come uh, up against a wall because they say that, yeah, but we need to go with the same functionality we have for our digitized content. And I keep telling them that's never going to be possible because we, I mean, we decide what metadata we ask for digitization. We decide the format. We decide everything. So that's why we can provide also amazing functionality. But how can I convince them that doing something, starting with some of these uh, things, is much better than waiting for that moment when everything is perfect? Who's going to pick that one up? <laughs> well, I'm just going to agree with you. <laughs> 
Um, it's really hard. If you if you look at um, our online services, our, the core of our catalogue is um, well, of discovery is a catalogue. It's a catalogue of paper, um, and it provides access to some digitised material. And increasingly, it does provide access to some more digital records, but it's still using the same kind of approach um, that we had for paper. You have to download things and take them away. And it's a real shift for us. Um, some of the exceptions have come from very specific formats. So if you look at the way web archives work, it's very different. We didn't try and squeeze them into a catalogue of paper. Um, I went to um, the session... The UK uh, government web archives. The UK ones, right? government, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? It's not a very good idea that, like, like you say, it's a very good except. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm interrupting Sonia here, but like, the the UK government web archive is part of the discovery catalogue, and like, it showcases exactly what you're saying. Like, it just it it doesn't necessarily work. Like, but there is it's it's very difficult. It is interesting metadata to be found in the catalogue that can enrich the UK government web archive like targets um, so like it's a bit like you don't not want it in the catalogue but then it's also not a great part to start that search on on that material um, so yeah still I don't I don't have an answer sorry <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's trying to do both isn't yeah. it so it's a very high level a series level description in the catalogue which talks about a web archive, but then the actual web archive is in the web archive service. Um, I don't think I'm answering your question, really, <laughs> at all. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Can I say something very brief about Born Digital, actually? Because one of the reasons I'm actually, I actually want to come this year to this conference is that it's one of the few spaces where Born Digital is kind of discussed in a mature and well-understood way, I guess. And I don't know whether this community realises how far it's sort of beyond how a lot of the other parts of the sectors we interact, you interact with think about the Born Digital, even seem to know it exists, right? And I think there's perhaps a, a sort of a, a moment of reflection around the Born Digital and how mature those concepts are in these communities and how they're not mature in other communities, particularly those communities who are going to need to use them kind of quite soon or should be using them now but don't know they exist properly. And I think that's one of the things I find really interesting about you know, I've sort of been dabbling in and out of kind of stuff around board digital for around the last eight or so years, and like this community has exploded and grown, and it's really wonderful the work that's going on. And I still having the same conversations with colleagues in other academic and non-academic sectors with regard to born digital, with like, well, what is that again? And like, oh, surely it's just like an email, it's just like a letter, right? And it's just like oh, we've not got beyond that, right? So. <laughs> Maybe that's part of the issue remains, which is like the, the, the wonderful expertise in this community maybe hasn't found its way in the kind of the um, uh, simplified terms the wrong way, not what I mean by it, hasn't sort of filtered its way out into communities in ways we might have hoped and expected. And maybe we need to influence people within our institutions to help that happen. And it was good to see, for example, um, on yesterday the DBC Awards, the way in which some of the um, Archives and Records Association affiliated, uh, not affiliated, was it? Was it? Um, sponsored sort of training programs are changing and embedding that work more um, integratedly within how like colleagues in those sectors are being trained at a kind of MA level because that's going to be really really valuable right Can I? Do we have time for another question oh, sorry. I'll say the last thing. so maybe just to come back to where we started maybe a little step so maybe we start by delivering emails as emails and not PDFs or something like that <laughs> and, and perhaps try to build from there <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, my name is Arif. I'm from Katana Shah Library. So my question is uh, just, uh, just you know, heads up. They won't be as interesting as you know, uh, um, understanding frictions between data provider and, and potential stakeholders. But I'm really sort of looking at it from a from a pragmatic standpoint. Um, if you are a memory organization, whether it's a library or, or a museum, and you've got a repository of content, whether it's born digital or digitized content, it's there in the repository. And now the the question is. If you were thinking about providing a, a computation access to your to your content, when should the thought begin? Is it at the time of mm -hmm. developing the repository, or uh, you know, it, it, or should one should, should an organisation be focusing on no 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 we, let's let's focus on the bare minimum and then we will build on that. And if it's latter, then what would a repository need to have from 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 get go 
So to, to sort of, you know, to implement competition access at the latest stage. Is it an API? Is it OIPMH? Uh, is, it, is it something else? Uh, and so related to that is that even if you, so let's just say you have, you know, somehow uh, had, had, had that growth and maturity and uh, you've given com com competition access, but then how do you sustain that? Is it about ensuring that the access that you're providing is value added? Are you measuring how, how, how people are using it, whether it's, it's actually you know, um, adding value to the services that you're offering so it becomes a core service? So I know I'm asking too many questions. And, 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 finally, and finally, it's about um, the ethics and, the, and the, the copyrights and the other, other aspects of that. Should computational access reflect, so if, you know, in traditional settings on a repository, when you're disseminating your content, you're already ensuring that if something is embargoed, it's not, it's, it's not you know, available to everybody, uh, or it's, it's available at a later stage. So should the same rules apply when you're actually enabling uh, you know, access in a non-traditional way, whether it's through an API, through tools, and other things? Sorry, it's just a three question problem. <laughs> wow, okay, what a closer. Okay, Who's gonna kick questions. off? I'm, gonna let you I'm happy to take this one. Um, like, starting to think about computational access as soon as possible is like, um, important. Just like we were pointing out a minute ago, like, starting that advocating quite early on is important because otherwise your emails could end up as a PDF and that's not as useful as like, having it in its like, native um, setting. But the great thing about the guide is that a lot of people actually contributed to it and there's a whole lot of case studies and examples in it of institutions that have been around for years and have just started thinking about computational access but also institutions that have done that from the get-go um, and also very different types of um, material or legislation so some people have a mandate to make it ex available to everyone as the National Archives has um, other ones are more privately, uh, have private collections and know who their users are. Um, but there's also just like really good examples of restricted access. Um, for example, Hasi Trust is a really good one um, to have a look at, especially their derived data sets. So yeah, um, get started as soon as possible. And that, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to jump to your last question, um, and you talked about embargoed material and should the same rules apply. So the issue is that we're beyond the point where an expert can review material by reading it and deciding what should be available and what shouldn't. Even if they do that, things will um, slip between the gaps. Arguably, they always have. But the discoverability of that is so much greater um, when you have computational access to born digital records. And that's where we are. That's the risk that we're grappling with. So um, should the same rules apply, you know, in, in theory perhaps, but in practice they can't, I think. We, we need a new way of thinking about this, a new way of looking at it. That's an appropriate place to end. Okay. Great. So thank you. I think we need to wrap up there. That was... Um, 45 minutes that flew by, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but a big thank you to Sonia James and Leontine for sharing their knowledge and wisdom on this topic so generously, and also for such great questions from the audience. Thank you.